four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. I'm sure most people have heard the song at this point, in which the true love of someone who presumably, or hopefully, owns an aviary given the amount of birds, gifts them an increasing number of gifts for Christmas over the course of 12 days. However, did you know that the 12 days of Christmas are actually a real Christmas tradition from the earliest days of the church, not just a silly carol? While today the Christmas celebrations typically begin after Thanksgiving, though nowadays stores are starting to decorate shortly after Halloween, to the point in which many are exhausted by the time December 25th comes around, traditionally, the celebrations of Christmas did not happen until Christmas Day itself. In fact, the time leading up to Christmas was, and is, to be a time of preparation for Christmas, known as Advent in the West and the Nativity Fast in the East. Though there are some differences in prescriptions, the motivation between the two remain the same. The period before Christmas is to be a time of spiritually preparing oneself for the birth of Christ through fasting, prayer, repentance, and almsgiving. In this period, both the body and the soul would be prepared toward more spiritual ends, away from earthly desires and passions. Instead of being a prolonged celebration ending at Christmas, the Christmas celebration was to actually begin on Christmas Day and last for 12 days until January 6th, which is another great feast of the church, that of Theophany, celebrating the baptism of Christ in the River Jordan by John in the east, or Epiphany, celebrating the arrival of the Magi in the west. January 6th actually came to be known as Little Christmas. While we're not for certain when this almost two-week celebration was established, it clearly has ancient origins. Canon 27 of the Second Council of Tours, taking place in AD 567, prescribes the time between the Nativity of the Lord and Epiphany for celebrations every day, already describing the practice as, quote, the ancient tradition instilled by the monks. So what are these 12 days? There are three types of observances that take place during this period. Those directly related to the birth of Christ, those that commemorate saints from the early period of the church, as it was still in its infancy, and those that commemorate saints that lived centuries after Christ, honoring him in notable ways. So without further ado, here are the 12 days of Christmas, as according to the tradition of the Orthodox Church. <laughs> The first day of Christmas is, well, Christmas Day. After a period of fasting and preparation, the day finally arrives celebrating the nativity of God born in the flesh. On a quiet night over 2,000 years ago, a baby was to be born in a cave being used as a stable because the inn was full. Mary and Joseph had traveled from Nazareth to the city of Bethlehem to take part in the empire-wide census of Caesar Augustus. A bright star appeared in the sky, and angels announced to shepherds tending to their flocks about the newborn child. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, in which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The shepherds came to see the child, and then spread word about the things told to them concerning the child and thus the Orthodox Church celebrates them as well, the first men to offer worship to Christ. Christmas Day celebrates the birth of Christ in addition to the shepherds who visited him in the manger, and the three wise men who would come later, bearing the three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh for the child. In emulation of the wise men bringing gifts to the Christ child, we exchange gifts with one another. The Orthodox Church celebrates the wise men, traditionally named Melchior, Kaspar, and Balthazar, on the day of Christmas, since their coming is related directly to the birth of Christ, with the hymn, Thy nativity, O Christ our God, has shown to the world the light of wisdom. For by it, those who worship the stars were taught by a star to adore thee, the Son of Righteousness, and to know thee, the Orient from on high. O Lord, glory to thee. In fact, church tradition states that at the advent of the baby Jesus, the magic of the Magi stopped working, and they consulted prophecies and the stars, concluding that either a god or a king had just been born, following the star to Judea. The Roman Catholic Church instead 
celebrates the coming of the Magi on Epiphany, January 6th. Christmas Day is the end of the fast, not for the reason to be a glutton, but in celebration of Christ's incarnation. December 26th, the second day of Christmas, is the Synaxis of Theotokos, which is a gathering of all the feasts and celebrations relating to the Virgin Mary and all the faithful to celebrate together. The day immediately following Christmas is dedicated to the Virgin due to her critical role in the plan for salvation, being the mother of Jesus and the one from whom he was able to take flesh. This is critically why it is very rare to see an Orthodox icon of the Virgin Mary without the Christ child present with her. This synaxis is one of the most famous feasts of the Virgin Mary in Christianity. The Sunday following Christmas, or the day after, if the Sunday after Christmas falls on January 1st, commemorates the other relatives of Christ, that being his ancestor King David, his adoptive father Joseph, and his stepbrother James the Just. King David, the prophet king of Israel and defeater of Goliath, was he who was to bear lineage of the promised Savior to come. The promises of God made to David would be fulfilled in Christ, which is why the name of David is so intimately connected with Jesus, being called the Son of David. As the author of the Psalms of David, in addition to prophecy, in his prayers, he gives words to every and all emotion belonging to man, from joy to sorrow to hope to despair, celebration and anger, and thus serves as the basis of prayer, both public and private, in the Orthodox Church. The righteous Joseph, also known as the betrothed, after he became a widower in his old age, was known to be a just and righteous man, and was chosen to be the husband and guardian of the Virgin Mary after she left the temple as a consecrated virgin. His kindness was exemplified when, after discovering Mary to be with child, sought to put her away instead of publicly exposing her, as the punishment for adultery at that time was stoning. After being assured by an angel that the child came from God, Joseph kept the two in his care, protecting and raising Jesus as his own son, even bringing him into his trade of carpentry. Joseph disappears from the Gospel accounts prior to the public ministry of Jesus, with the tradition holding that he reposed at the age of 110, with the words, quote, the pains and the fears of death encompass me, but my soul has become calm again since I have heard thy voice. Jesus my defender, Jesus my savior, Jesus my refuge, Jesus whose name is sweet to my mouth and to the heart of all who love thee. James the Just, brother of the Lord, was a son of Joseph from a previous marriage and accompanied his father, Mary, and the Christ child to Egypt after the warning given by the angel to flee. Being the only of Joseph's children to be willing to share his inheritance with Christ after his father's passing, he became known as Brother of the Lord, becoming one of his apostles and later serving as the head of the church in Jerusalem, the mother church of all Christians. Being a major leader in the early church, known for his strong spiritual life, he gained esteem among both Christians and Jews. Because he publicly preached about the Godhood of Christ, however, the Jewish authorities had him thrown from the roof of the temple and stoned. Also remember this day is the flight into Egypt, in which Joseph, taking his son James with Mary and Jesus, to flee the wrath of King Herod, escaped into Egypt until Herod's passing. The third day of Christmas commemorates proto-martyr Stephen the Archdeacon, the first Christian martyr following Christ's ascension into heaven and one of the seven original deacons. The apostles, wishing to devote themselves fully to prayer and the teaching of the faith, laid hands upon the seven choice men, ordaining them as deacons, who would go and minister to the material and physical needs of the growing brethren. Stephen, head of the deacons, went above and beyond strictly attending to the material needs, but being filled with grace, he worked miracles and spoke with authority among the people as well with no one able to argue against him. Being brought before the Sanhedrin, the high priest's council, he was accused of blasphemy and intention to subvert the law. In answering these charges before the council, he recounted the history of the Jewish nation, about the many times God condescended with kindness and patience, showing miracles and promising salvation, 
but they had always remained stone-hearted and resisted, persecuting the prophets, and most recently, killing the promised Messiah. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the Just One, of whom you are now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. As he spoke, the council grit their teeth in anger, as Stephen's face shone like an angel, and he proclaimed to see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. Their anger bursting forth, they dragged him out of the city and stoned him, and his final words, echoing those on the cross, Lord, lay not this sin at their charge. The Apostle John and the Virgin Mary were witness to his martyrdom, and tradition holds the Gamaliel, teacher of St. Paul, retrieved his body and buried it in his own estate, being a secret Christian himself. Stephen was the starting point of all the martyrs, being the first to shed his blood for the gospel. December 28th, the fourth day of Christmas, remembers the 20,000 martyrs of Nicomedia. In the year AD 302, during the reign of the Emperor Maximian, Christianity continued to spread throughout the empire. The emperor gave a decree to deprive all rights and privileges of citizenship from Christians, destroying their churches and burning their holy books. Despite this, many on his court were secretly baptized as Christians. Returning from war against the Ethiopians, he ordered sacrifice to the gods to be offered throughout the empire. Upon reaching Nicomedia with his victory trophies, he ordered everyone to assemble to give honor to the gods under threat of death. Christians began to leave the square, enraging the emperor, and, if not for a thunderstorm, he would have ordered for their deaths. After the execution of several high-profile people who had converted to Christianity whom he saw as a threat, he was informed of the coming of Christmas, in which the Christians of the city would be gathered together. Setting up an altar to a pagan god, he announced to the congregation that any who wished to save their life should come out and give sacrifice. The deacon, proclaiming to the congregation to remember the three holy youths who refused to worship the idol in Babylon, inspired them all to resist. As the soldiers surrounded the church, the bishop, Anthemus, rushed to baptize all the catechumens and to commune everyone with Holy Communion. The flames spread throughout with heavy smoke, suffocating everyone in the church as they sang. The burning lasted for five days, but instead of the smell of burnt flesh, when the church was opened, a heavenly scent pervaded the air. After the burning of the church and those within, Maximian ordered for any other Christian in the city to be found and put to death, adding more martyrs to the death toll. In addition to the Nicomedian martyrs, the Orthodox Church also remembers another of the seven original deacons, Nicanor, Apostle of the Seventy, who also suffered the day of Stephen's stoning, also being stoned with other Christians that day. The fifth day of Christmas, December 29th, remembers the Holy Innocents, the 14,000 children who were killed by King Herod in his attempt to kill the prophesied King of Israel. After Herod gave the information to the Magi of where the King of Israel was prophesied to be born, he pressed them to return to him about his whereabouts. However, after being warned by an angel, the three wise men went another way, infuriating Herod upon learning he was deceived. Calculating the time from which the Magi's star first appeared, he ordered his soldiers to kill every male child under the age of two in Bethlehem and the surrounding districts, fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah. Quote, in Ramah there was a voice heard, Lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. Since Rachel's tomb is in Bethlehem, it was as if she arose with all the mothers to mourn with them. Likewise, being aware of the auspicious birth of John the Baptist, Herod demanded that John's father, the priest Zachariah, give him his whereabouts. Refusing, Zachariah was killed in the temple, as Elizabeth fled into the wilderness. 
And after his slaughter of the children, Herod turned his ire to his own court, and to those who told him where the Christ child would be born. He killed the high priest and the seventy elders of the Sanhedrin. Thus those who plotted with Herod met an evil in themselves. Herod was soon stricken with disease, in which his body was slowly eaten away by worms, covered in sores before finally dying, his soul being given over to damnation. In addition to the Holy Innocents, all Orthodox Christians who died as martyrs for Christ by hunger, thirst, freezing, and any other violent death are remembered, whose names are not known to us. For even the least known of these saints will shine more radiant in the final days than even the most prominent kings on earth. December 30th, the sixth day of Christmas, remembers the Apostle Timon, the deacon of the Seventy. Initially chosen to minister to destitute widows, he was chosen to be bishop of the city of Bostra in Syria, where he led many to Christ, despite being ill-treated by the pagans there. He was eventually thrown into a red-hot furnace, but remained unharmed, and was then crucified, surrendering his soul to Christ. Also commemorated this day is the virgin martyr Anicia of Thessalonica. Being born to a wealthy family who converted to Christianity, they instilled in their daughter all manner of virtue. Both her parents died when she was at a young age, leaving her but an orphan. While spending time in prayer at her house, she would sell everything, setting all the household slaves free and giving them plenty of gold, and she divested herself of all her inheritance, spreading her wealth among the poor and the sick of the city. As the persecutions of Maximian raged, giving free reign to kill Christians without trial or charge, she was stopped one day on her way to church, a soldier approaching her with impure desire. Declaring herself a servant of Christ, he grabbed at her veil, pulling her toward him, and she shoved him back and spit on his face. Enraged, the soldier drew his sword and ran her through, killing her in the year AD 298. When the persecution ended, a church was built at the site in her honor. The seventh day of Christmas, December 31st, is liturgically the leave-taking of Christmas, as the days after January 1st are known as the Four Feast of Theophany, in preparation of the next great feast. Commemorated this day is Mother Melania the Younger, the nun of Rome. When Christianity was legalized, Many women of Roman aristocracy were captivated by the stories of the ascetics in Egypt and the words of St. Jerome, and forsook their possessions to be monastic themselves. Milani was born to wealthy and devout parents, who hoped that she would marry well and have children. At 14 years old, she was married against her wishes to a young noble of the name of Valerius Pinianus. She asked him to live with her in chastity, however, he said he could not agree to that unless they had two children to continue their line. While appearing to be dressed as a noble, she secretly wore a rough garment under her clothes to mortify her flesh. She would give birth to a daughter whom they dedicated to God, and then a son, who suffered complications in birth and died soon after being baptized. Falling ill herself, she told her husband that she would only be healed if he pledged that from then on they would live as brother and sister, to which he agreed. At the death of their daughter as well, the two took their wealth to journey and help the poor, building many hospitals and sporting monasteries. Eventually traveling to Jerusalem, they distributed the rest of their goods and settled on the Mount of Olives, rarely seeing one another after that. St. Melania would found a monastery where 90 virgins dedicated themselves there, though she would never become abbess out of humility. Around this time, Saint Epinianus reposed, and she buried him and spent another four years in fasting and prayer. After establishing a monastery for men, she ventured back to Rome at the request of her uncle, a notable pagan. On his deathbed and gravely ill, she was able to convince him to receive baptism before his death. Returning to her monastery, the saint sensed her own death and gave her final instructions to the sisters, and reposed in peace in the year 439. Also commemorated this day is St. Zotticus, Keeper of Orphans. Educated by the best masters in Rome, he was chosen by the Emperor Constantine to help in construction of the new imperial capital of Constantinople. When leprosy struck the city, 
Constantine ordered that all those afflicted to be driven out or drowned in the sea as to prevent the spread. Zodocus, however, approached the emperor, requesting a large amount of gold in order to obtain jewels and pearls to enhance the imperial glory. When he received the gold, he put it toward ransoming those who were being led to exile or drowned, and tended to the sick, taking them to the far shore of the Bosphorus, where he had set up tents and shelters to care for them. When Constantius succeeded his father and became emperor, a partisan of the Arians, some courtiers, envious of the favor Zodocus received under his father's reign, accused him before the emperor of wasting public funds. When summoned before the court, Zodocus offered to show the emperor the jewels he had purchased, and showed him the tents and the sick houses he had built. The lepers approached in procession, which included Constantius' own daughter, whom Zodocus saved from drowning. However, instead of joy, the emperor was filled with rage, and ordered the saint to be seized, tied behind wild mules, and dragged across the stones. A stream of pure water sprung forth from the spot he died. On the eighth day after the birth of Jesus, it is the remembrance of his circumcision in accordance with the law given to Abraham. The infant Jesus is presented to the temple and circumcised in the flesh, in addition to receiving the name of Jesus, as Gabriel had announced to the Virgin Mary. The circumcision demonstrates that he is fully man in the flesh not an apparition or illusion of a fleshly body. Likewise, it was in keeping with the Old Testament law as to fulfill the entirety of the law which he had given to the prophets. This sign of covenant with God would be replaced with baptism in the church and new covenant formed. In addition to the circumcision, Saint Basil the Great is also commemorated this day. Basil was born during the reign of Emperor Constantine, while still unbaptized, he spent 15 years in Athens, where he studied philosophy, rhetoric, astronomy, and all other secular sciences of the time. His colleagues there were Gregory the Theologian and Julian, later the apostate emperor. In his mature years, he was baptized in the Jordan River, along with Ebulios, his former teacher. He was a bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia for almost 10 years and completed his earthly life 50 years after his birth. He was a great defender of orthodoxy, a great light of moral purity, a religious zealot, a great theological mind, a great builder and pillar of the Church of God. In liturgical services, he is often referred to as the bee of the Church of Christ, which brings honey to the faithful, and with its stinger, pricks the heretics. Numerous works of this father are preserved they include theological, apologetic, ascetical, and canonical writings, as well as the holy and divine liturgy named after him. This divine liturgy is celebrated ten times throughout the year, on the 1st of January, in remembrance of him, on the eve of the Nativity of the Lord, on the eve of the Theophany of the Lord, all Sundays of Great Lent except Palm Sunday, on Great and Holy Thursday, and on Great and Holy Saturday. St. Basil reposed peacefully on January 1st, AD 379, and entered into the kingdom of Christ. The ninth day of Christmas, January 2nd, commemorates St. Sylvester, Pope of Rome. Sylvester was born in Rome and from his early youth was learned in worldly wisdom and in the faith of Christ. He always conducted his life according to the Gospel commandments and benefited much from the instruction of Timothy, the priest whose death for the faith Sylvester himself witnessed. Observing the example of the heroic sacrifice of his teacher, he was imbued with such a spirit throughout his entire life. Becoming Bishop of Rome at the age of 30, he reformed certain Christian customs. For example, he dispensed with the fast on Saturdays, which had been practiced by many Christians up until that time, and ordered that fasting be observed only on Holy and Great Saturday, as well as those Saturdays that fell within the fasting seasons. By his prayers and miracles, Sylvester assisted in bringing Emperor Constantine and his mother, Helena, to the true faith and baptism. With the Empress Helena, he took part in finding the true cross, and he governed the Church of God for 20 years. 
His earthly life ended honorably, and he entered into the heavenly kingdom in the year 335. Saint Seraphim Sarov is also commemorated this day. One of the greatest Russian ascetics, clairvoyant elders, and miracle workers. Growing up loving to read the lives of the saints, attending the church services, and spending time in prayer, at the age of 18, the young Seraphim resolved to become a monk. Immediately at the monastery, he entered strict abstinence from food and sleep, struggling in strict asceticism. Receiving a blessing from an elder, he withdrew more and more into seclusion in the woods, where he would see a vision of the Virgin Mary and the Apostle John, who appeared and healed him from an illness. Seraphim was distinguished by great humility. While the entire world praised him, he referred to himself as, quote, the wretched Seraphim. Taking the name of Seraphim, at upon receiving monastic vows, he burned with a zeal for God, and often shone with the light of an angel, achieving great heights. Wild animals often came to his hut, and a nun once witnessed him feeding a bear from his hand. One day, a group of robbers came to him and beat him severely, thinking that he might have some treasure hidden in his hut. Beating him to the point of unconsciousness, blood seeping from his face, the robbers only found an icon of the Mother of God, where the saint prayed in his hermitage. From that point on, he always remained hunched over due to the beating. Soon after, he would spend 1,000 days on a rock near his hut, arms raised to heaven in prayer. After this point, he began to admit visitors, thousands who wished to visit him for guidance. One of his most famous quotes is, Acquire a peaceful spirit, and around you thousands will be saved. In 1833, another monk noticed the smell of smoke from Seraphim's hut, and, knowing he often left candles lit, worried that it might catch fire. While I am alive, he once said, there will be no fire, but when I die, my death shall be revealed by a fire. When they opened the door, it appeared that books and other things were smoldering. Saint Seraphim was found kneeling before an icon of the Mother of God, with his arms crossed at his chest. His pure soul was taken by the angels at the time of prayer, and had flown off to the throne of the Almighty God, whose faithful servant, Saint Seraphim, had been all his life. Saint Seraphim has promised to intercede for those who remember his parents, Isidor and Agathea. January 3rd, the second day of the Four Feasts of Theophany, the tenth day after Christmas, the Orthodox Church remembers the holy prophet Malachi. Malachi was the last of the Old Testament prophets, and is thus called the Seal of the Prophets. He was born after the return of the Hebrews from the Babylonian captivity, in 538 BC, he was unusually handsome in countenance. According to tradition, people called him an angel, perhaps because of his external beauty, or because of his spiritual purity, or even perhaps because of his association with an angel of God. On many occasions, he spoke face to face with an angel. When this occurred, others heard the angel's voice, but they were not worthy to see the face of the angel. The young Malachi prophesied that which the angel proclaimed. He cried out against the ungrateful Israel and against the lawless priests. 500 years before Christ, Malachi clearly prophesied the coming and the mission of John the Baptist. Lo, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. Mainly, he is chiefly the prophet of the day of the dreadful judgment. Quote, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and terrible day. He reposed in the Lord while still young. Following him, there were no more prophets in Israel until John the Baptist. The eleventh day of Christmas, the third day of the four feasts of Theophany, is the synaxis of the seventy holy apostles. Besides the twelve greater apostles, the Lord chose seventy lesser apostles and sent them to preach the gospel. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. But just as Judas, one of the twelve, fell away from the Lord, so did some of the seventy abandon him, not with the intention of betrayal, 
but because human weakness and faint-heartedness. Quote, As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former ways of life, and no longer accompanied him. As Judas's place was filled by another apostle, so too were the places of these lesser apostles filled by others that were chosen. These seventy lesser apostles labored the same work as did the twelve greater apostles. They were co-workers with the twelve in spreading and establishing the church of God in the world. They endured many sufferings, malevolent acts from men and demons, but their faith and fervent love for the resurrected Lord made them victors over the world and inhabitants of the kingdom of heaven. January 5th, the twelfth day of Christmas, the fourth day of the Four Feasts of Theophany, is funnily enough a day of strict fasting in preparation of Theophany, in which the feasting begins again. Commemorated this day are Hierom Martyr Theopemptus, Bishop of Nicomedia, and Martyr Theonas. When Diocletian began his persecution of the Christians, Theopemptus, Bishop of Nicomedia, was among the first to suffer martyrdom for Christ. He was brought before the emperor, who threatened him with the punishment of death if he did not deny Christ. To that threat, the courageous bishop responded to the emperor, quote, It stands written, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. O emperor, you have the authority over my body. Do with it as you please. Theopemptos was severely beaten, starved and tortured in various ways. Finally, the emperor summoned a certain magician, Theonas by name, to outwit this godly man through magic. Theonas dissolved the most potent poison in water and gave it to Theopemptos to drink. Theopemptos traced the sign of the cross over the glass and drank the poison. On seeing that the poison had no effect on him, Theonas turned to the emperor and shouted, I too am a Christian and I bow down before the crucified one. Both were sentenced to death in the year A.D. 298. Theopemptos was beheaded, and Theonas was buried alive. They suffered honorably and became citizens of the kingdom of Christ. With the days of Christmas over, January 6th commemorates the Theophany of Christ, when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. When our Lord reached 30 years from his physical birth, he began his teaching and salvific work. He himself signified this beginning of the beginning by his baptism in the Jordan River. St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, quote, The beginning of the world is water. The beginning of the gospel is the Jordan. The word theophany means the appearance or manifestation of God, and it is fitting that the ministry of Christ on earth begins with the full revelation of the Trinity, which was a mystery in the Old Testament. Jesus, the Son of God and second member of the Trinity, is baptized in the waters by John, and, when this occurs, the Holy Spirit descends from heaven in the form of a dove and rests upon him, and the voice of the Father announced that Christ was his Son, in whom he was well pleased. In this moment, all three persons of the Holy Trinity are revealed. In addition, while our baptisms are for the cleansing of sin, when Jesus is baptized, he purifies the waters of the world and prefigures his own death and our future baptisms, dying in the waters and rising out of them again. The Feast of the Theophany is also called the Feast of Illumination. The event in the Jordan River illuminates us by manifesting God to us as Trinity, consubstantial and undivided. And the second way is that every one of us, through baptism in the water, is illumined, in that we become adopted by the Father of Lights through the merits of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. Just as how the Virgin Mary is celebrated on the day after Christmas due to her large role in his birth, John the Baptist has the day after Theophany dedicated to him for his role in baptizing Jesus in the Jordan. Overall, let us remember that the time for celebration of Christmas begins on Christmas Day, and we should carry that joy into the new year and beyond. 
Thanks for watching everyone, and I just wanted to wish you all and your loved ones a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I have a lot of big and exciting projects planned for the new year, particularly with more media and cultural analysis, so I hope you stay tuned for that, and again, feel free if there are any ideas you'd like me to examine, let me know in the comments. Once again, Merry Christmas, and I will see you all in the new year.